Okay, hi Molly. Hi Raha. We're on. Awesome. <sighs> All right, so we get to have a second go at talking about the Heirloom Zine project, yeah. talking a little bit about what it is, what our intentions are, mm -hmm. um, and kind of like the backstory for folks, right? Yeah. Hi, everyone. We want to tell you about this project. We really want to get you involved and get your thoughts. So we thought we'd do a little video audio situation. <laughs> so, do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Do you want to start off with um, telling, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and a little bit about the project? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm Raha. I am, uh, I am an artist, Iranian born, living in the U.S. currently. And, um, well, I always feel like I need to say how I know you. So I met Molly in the Bay Area several years ago. And, um, you said, say about me and what? Oh, uh, well, you could talk about our intentions for the project or what it is if you'd like right. to. Um, and so here we are, we're, we've put out this call for contributions for a zine, which we're calling Heirloom. And it's a zine concerned with stories of cultural wounding and cultural healing and um, I decided to help you do this this was really your idea your seed and when you came to me with it um, there was something that called to me that said I wanted to be part of it with you so um, so can you, okay, how about you say something about your story? Sure. <laughs> no, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I, yeah, I just feel like you being a part of this has added so much um, vitality to it. So um, thank you for, for saying that, um, for, st for starting us off. So yeah, I'm Molly Moorhead. I live in Lincoln, Nebraska now, which is where I'm from. I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area in Oakland specifically for eight years and that's where Raha and I met um and I thought for a second we met at a dance thing but that's not true at all but you got me into some dance things <laughs> well wow, which was amazing but um so my backstory with this is kind of a little long and, and winding but for and I'll speak on that a little bit, but what I want to say for now just is that I feel very young in doing all of this work and I'm letting that be the case. Um, I'm assuming that I'm going to make mistakes and, uh, this is really why I wanted to create this zine because I want to learn from people and I want to do so in a personal way. I feel like I can read scholarly articles all day long, and I and I do sometimes um, on different topics related to uh, to different ways culture has been destroyed and stolen and lost. And um, I can read about some of the things that people are doing uh, to repair that damage. Um, but I'm interested in the personal stories. Mm -hmm. um, that's really, I feel like, for me, where a lot of the healing is, and when we make things just like like extremely personal, just like nitty gritty detail personal. Mm -hmm. So uh, that really is part of my intention. I just feel like this is something a lot of people are wanting and needing, um, whatever their background is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if I may, I there's an interesting thing happening right here now in Lincoln. Uh, there's a student at the university here who is a part of whatever um, like white supremacist organization led that rally in Charlottesville. Like, I don't remember what they're called. Like he's like a known <clears throat> neo-Nazi and there's a rally today about it. And I was just feeling like a rally is saying like, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like we don't support this. This isn't about free speech. And to me, this whole reality just speaks so much to people 
really grappling with like what is my culture how can I find myself in this time and place like where do I come from how do I um I find a sense of self in a positive way um so it feels really important um so that's really a lot of my intention here um yeah cool as you were talking I was thinking to give some clarity about what we mean when we say cultural wounding and healing. I think mm-hmm. of culture as a set of, um, a set of practices um, and relationships between people and the material world, between people and where they live, and between people and the plant world that they mm-hmm. rely on um, and relate to. And that um, cultural loss would refer to it's not that just we each as individuals um it's about it's about us as part of collectives that it's important for every it's important to the livelihood of every individual that they belong to a cultural lineage and i think that i think it's like a a human need yeah. No, we don't even know that half the time. Yeah, absolutely. And that might be some of these, you know, unknown unknowns or places where we've lost culture, meaning we've lost our connection to our collective. We're not even aware of. Yeah. Yeah. If I may dovetail on that, I really feel it also in terms of like a culture that is that stretches back in time, um, in a, in a real way. I don't even mean in like some continuous perfect way. I just mean like really just that has that connection and we're aware of it. And, um, that has some aspect of being sustainable actually, like really grounding humans in the larger web of life, not keeping us apart from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized you said a little bit about you, um, you know, that you're from Iran and now you live in the U S and we know you also, you know, lived in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't say anything about myself regarding that, but like, I'm, I think I'm kind of like your average white American who's like, Oh wait, I have a culture. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going through that this past couple of years, figuring all out all of that. Most of my ancestors, well, all my ancestors came from Europe. A lot of them came from Scotland and England and, and putting all of those pieces together now, which is partly why I feel so um, young in all of this. Yeah. And learning about more about, you know, the history that led to um, col- um, colonization of the Americas. Yeah. Right. The precursor. Mm-hmm. What, what, what happened to your people that enabled you to your people to also colonize the Americas. I wonder if you should read that paragraph from the call that you wanted to read. Yeah, happily. So, thank you. This is from our call for contributions. Um, So, we are interested in unearthing and rediscovering these lost roots, whether they were lost within your lifetime or generations ago. We want to witness you reaching in the dark for what you don't know you don't know. Or we want to hear about the losses of which you are all too aware and the ways you struggle to reclaim these stolen parts. Or we want to hear about your effort to find power and meaning in what is often framed as an intractable loss. We would like to begin sowing the seeds of a cultural lineage, the fruits of which may only be harvested in centuries' time by our children's children's children. We are in it for the long haul. We want you to. We want to join you in recognizing how lost we might all be. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking maybe, like, I would like to say a little bit about what that all means to me, and Please. maybe you can do that also. So, um, so to speak about what cultural loss means to somebody with my history just as a way to offer an entry point into the project for other people. Um, I was an immigrant at eight years old. Um, I left Iran with my family and we moved to Canada 
than when I was a teenager we moved to the U.S. And so for me, cultural loss feels very recent and it feels very palpable, you know, within my lifetime, kind of, um, there, are, there's a lot of grief and resentment about the ways that I was encouraged and expected to turn on to the, turn on the people from which I came and to then see them as disgusting, stupid, and uncivilized, and to disavow everything that I knew up to that point. All of the foods that I grew up eating, um, medicinal practices, ways of relating to other people, relationship to land, and relationship to my own body, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so that all, for me, like that trauma has happened in my lifetime. And um, so when I think about this project, that's what comes to mind. And the process is really making amends with the pain of that and the grief of that and making room for it. Mm. And I'm not even at the place of like really rec reclaiming anything. I just at the place of letting myself remember what it was like to be an eight-year-old and um, an ideological force of whiteness and racism and um, imperialism on my body. So, um, so that's one way to think about mm -hmm. cultural loss, losing, healing. Um, how about you? <laughs> Oh, well, I just want to say one, yeah. just want to reflect one thing, like, which maybe goes without saying, but it's not like your family was like, we, you know, we're kind of bored here in Iran. Yeah. Like, we should, like, see what it's like in Canada. Like, that's not what happened. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like, you were, you had to leave. Right. Yeah. Right. People, people don't leave their homes unless it's it's bad and it would it seems that it would be better to give everything up right elsewhere but if you don't know that history you can look it up yeah totally yeah that's googleable i just wanted to say <laughs> not you personally just anybody <laughs> <laughs> anyone who's like wait what what's the history with with that yeah no totally um I mean, I just think about how hard it is to move at all, like how hard mm -hmm. it was to move for me personally to move to California and then to move back to Nebraska and how fucking expensive it was mm -hmm. and how much credit card debt I have from it, you know, and take that and multiply it, you know, mm -hmm. people don't do this because they want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for myself, um, oh, there's just so much. I mean, so... I mean, it's like one thing is to to be like a little bit sequential in terms of my own experience. Like I always mm -hmm. very far back felt a sense of grief and pain um, emotionally when I thought of certain things like when I and when I looked around at the culture that I was presented with. And one thing that I was really struck by from a very young age was, um, all the disposable crap, all the plastic and food that wasn't really food. And, um, so that really led me on a journey, a uh, really weird, but very common journey into trying to solve that problem. And for me that, uh, cause it felt, it just felt so bad. It felt like there has to be something better than this. I'm sure that there is. Um, and what it led me into, the most was yoga and Ayurveda, which is one of the traditional medicine systems from India. I got really into it, like first just for my health. And then I went to school, you know, I did mm -hmm. four years, two clinical internships, the whole deal, built a business around that. And, um, slowly and painfully realized that it never fit at all. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many ways Ayurveda has helped me, like the philosophies and the plants and the whole deal truly like with different physical problems. Um, but there were so many ways that it was a mismatch. And 
so many ways that it was the way it was taught to me wasn't actually uh grounded in what Ayurveda really was and is in India, like so much reinterpretation, like by white Westerners and repackaging to make it fit, um, in modern American society. Um, like so many layers of crap and realizing in my part, like realizing, Oh, like this, you know, is not the answer at all. I'm not saying it's not the answer for someone. I I think it could probably be helpful for lots of Indian people to learn about their traditional medicine Mm -hmm. and for other people who feel really called and want to go deep. And um, there's just in terms of climate, in terms of culture, in terms of geology, in terms of spirituality, there's just like barrier after barrier. And the deeper I got into it, the more it didn't fit. And so, um, yeah, it's, I've really just been in this journey of figuring out like, oh, this thing that was missing all along, it wasn't some like exotic and mystical thing from Asia. <laughs> it was just my own culture was what was missing this whole time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like hilarious, right? When yeah. I, I think it's hilarious at this point when I say it, I've been furious a lot, mm-hmm. but, um, right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's there's so much right and in terms of like what you share Raha about um for you know, forced migration and assimilation um for myself and a lot of other maybe most white people mm-hmm. in like settler countries like the U.S. um like many of our ancestors went through that in a different way a long time ago. Mm-hmm. It's so weird to think about it. It's like the same shit. It's the same mm-hmm. shit. It's expressed in different ways, but sometimes it's not that differently. Like right. um, just like levels um, and generations of forced assimilation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> So we could probably keep talking and unpacking um, the ways both of our stories contain places where we were hurt and places then where we um, avoided dealing with that so that we could exist. Um, and in turn, God, I would love to hear how you've avoided dealing with it. That's actually so fascinating to me. Because I already shared. I went to, like, I'm going to do this magical thing from India. Yeah, it's interesting. For, ten, for think, 10 fucking years. Right. I think people who are socialized as white um, feel an absence that then um, uh, whiteness tells them they could fill by taking other people's things. But people who are not socialized as white, how did I cope? Uh, well, I try to be white in a lot of ways where I think that I should be or that it's better. And I think that is a coping mechanism. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to think more about it, but it, it avoids the actual, it avoids actually having to deal with myself and it perpetuates the emptiness and it perpetuates the sense that, um, there's something inferior about who I am or who my people are. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, like, and to contextualize that, like I've heard you say, you know, like about food specifically, right. Like trying to like, like being ashamed of like the food that your family ate. Sure. Yeah. I mean, to be different. many brown kids can um, sympathize with like coming to school with some container of like, Something that smells glorious, actually. I'm sure it smells so, so good. It smells so good. But when you're a kid in school and the, like, the oppression is so strong, everything that has smell is bad. Yeah, Unless right. It smells like fried grease. So, um, yeah, just like the deep shame for these. And then, and then to get older and watch these hip neighborhoods you live in and this like cool Indian spot or blah, 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 blah. And the smells are in the streets and white people just 
Mm, love it. <laughs> we can't we can't get enough of it actually. <laughs> There's a lot of rage there. <laughs> I like laughing and crying. I know it's so funny, and it's so funny because it's like, why, why can you not get enough of that? Because you're missing something you're that like was stolen. Starving. Yeah, yeah, you're starving for something that connects you to something. You're yeah. starving for smell, and and then and then I'm like enraged because 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 of another kind of pattern of of wounding. It's it's fascinating. Well, because cause it, it's all great to make curry and eat it and whatever, whatever but then it's like, yeah. it's a little out of context, right? And it's like the short story you just told about food and bringing the container of food and this, you know, it's like right. to just like waltz into there and not know the history. I mean, it's really sad. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, we could talk about this forever. I'm just like thinking. And we and we have actually. Yeah. <laughs> We've talked already forever. Hey, we should talk about though about the name yeah. and about the image. Yeah. Um how about I talk about the name and you talk about the image okay. that we chose. Mm-hmm. Does that sound good? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. that actually fits with this perfectly. Um so and yeah, and the the image we put on the cover might change. Like I would love it if it were someone else's art and not mine, because mm-hmm. that's what I want. But um, th- we chose the name heirloom after some deliberation. Um, it the concept just felt like it fit so perfectly because the so in my looking up the word and what it meant, I think I, I traced it back to Middle English. I couldn't get it farther back than that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's from the two words heir and loom. Heir being someone who inherits something, and loom literally being like what you weave on, like a tool that would have been very useful if you were making your own clothing, your own cloth. Um, but the connotation is that it is something precious. And uh, I specifically, like the word is loom, but in the definition, like, so the, the connotation is that it's precious, but the implication also is that it's a tool. So it's like, what tools have we inherited? And in some cases, I mean, to me, like, I feel like I could spend the rest of my life reflecting on that because there's so many layers to it of like, well, what is useful and what is actually bullshit? And where is there just absence? Where does it just feel like radio silence, you know? And then what actually has come through in some way or another that really is precious? Right. Yeah. And also you're making me think that it's it's dealing with, the tools we've inherited, but also facing forward um, the tools we want to pass on or, um, you know, trying to make that decision consciously now, recognizing how much we've all lost and how how much there is to reconcile with. Because we're the ancestors of the future. Right. Yeah. Mm. Um, I want to make sure everything's functioning, so hang on one second. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay. Um, great, thank you. And so, yeah. so Molly um, painted this the image that's on the call, which is a quince. Actually, you know more. I feel like I want you to talk about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can say I can jump. You in. can jump you in. Start. So it's this fruit that um, to me it's like a weird mangly apple (laughs) it's really hard and well we were talking about how it's important to have a mascot I like this that um we also need like to decide what organisms what plants what beings are part of this journey with us that it's not um a generic tree (laughs) Tree emoji. Right. The tree emoji, the universal <laughs> symbol for plant. Plant emoji. <laughs> Seed. But seedling, but um but that but that each plant is unique and each plant has its own lineage and belongs to certain geographical landscapes and people. And the quince for me has resonance because I re- we I remember it from my childhood in Iran. I remember marmalades and jams made of quince. 
and it was and my family loved it. I don't I don't I remember it being very floral and sweet. Mm -hmm. Um and so when you chose it, I I was like, yeah, I like that. It's something that it makes sense for me because it's like it's like a memory of a memory. So mm -hmm. it, it recalls back to what I, I lost. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. you said that you just kept seeing it everywhere. I just kept <laughs> seeing it. Like, I would start, I'd be like, okay, well, we should figure this imagery out. I would close my eyes, and I would see a big quince. Thank God one of us <laughs> And that, that, that drawing that I made uh, was based on a photo I took mm -hmm. of a quince from my neighborhood in Oakland, because mm -hmm. there were several quince trees in my neighborhood that um, I think had been there. Some of them had been there a very long time, like, when people you know, came there and built that neighborhood in the 1920s, like they planted all kinds of fruit trees, um, yeah. including quince. And uh, so, yeah, it's a specific quince. It's not something I got like off of, mm. you know, a botanical illustration someone else made. It really was a fruit that I ate myself. Right. Um, and I love, um, I love that you have to cook quince. Right. I, like there's certain, I read when I was reading about this, I read there are certain types that you, that if they, um, they can ripen sufficiently on the tree and you can eat them raw. But I have never encountered such a quince. Um, <laughs> the, nor the varieties that one normally encounters, they're like a very astringent potato kind of, like you have to cook them. And um, I just like the idea of like, you have to you have to work for this stuff. Yeah, kind of like you can't just like pluck it off the tree and expect that to work because right. it's gonna be like have this weird fuzzy coating and it's not gonna taste anything remotely like food at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have to like work a little bit harder. You have to dig a little deeper. Right. Mm -hmm. And you said the plant itself is native to where? Uh, well, Iran and right. surrounding places West Asia, but also yeah. like in Europe well because where was it brought from from yeah from West Asia from Iran it was just spread out um and it there's they've bred it and mm -hmm. certain varieties are more cold tolerant than others mm -hmm. so they grow like in into northern Europe mm -hmm. um maybe not Scandinavia gotcha. but like England and Scotland they grow there supposedly I'm not seen this with my right. own eyes but that's what I read um they're all over yeah they're all over the world now but like most people I feel like don't know about yeah. it they might know about the jelly but they don't know the fruit yeah which also it works well with our theme of not knowing it does right <laughs> it does I love it I used to work at a wine and cheese store and we sold that jelly because it goes so well with certain cheeses yeah, yeah, yeah. and people were like what does this mean? Like <laughs> in the Spanish name is Membrillo and they're like, okay. it was just like this thing, this monolithic thing that existed. <laughs> People had no context for where it came from, yeah. but I did cause I had a Quinn street on the street. Right. <laughs> cause right. I was blessed in that way. Right. I just, yeah. love, I just love stories of just like one person's relationship to like one plant being. <laughs> You can, like, listen to that all day. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so I think we need to end, because I just got a thing that says my startup disc is almost full. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? Um, no, just please share with us everything that this brings up for you. I mean, um, we're not... We're just... We just want to have a wider conversation very much like this one. Mm -hmm. How about you? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, I think uh, even just talking about some of this stuff uh, frees it up. Like there's yeah, an aspect of healing, and I don't mean healing like I will be healed because it's good luck, but um, more like a spaciousness. Mm -hmm. Like I can talk about this and people don't hate me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we might get more submissions than we can publish, right? And that's not an insult if we don't publish what you submit. I'm so glad that you took the time to draw and write and reflect and be with this conversation. Um, 
and I don't know if we're doing, we, we don't yet know what we're intending for the future, if this is a one-time deal or if we'll do it again, but um, there is that potential. And um, we, yeah, we just so appreciate your engagement. Mm-hmm. And there's other ways to, con- you know, to participate also, like, you know, I've heard from a few people who said that they did not feel at all called to contribute, but they want to read it. They want to buy it. They want to share it. So that's just as valuable actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we just want these ideas to circulate and we want to talk Mm -hmm. to people, but also if people are to submit things, we want there to be some amount of compensation, which is why we can't just publish everything. Yeah. And also certain things might not fit perfectly. They might be amazing, but they're not the right fit or yeah, whatever it is. It's not um, a rejection actually. I feel like yeah, of course. I could talk about rejection for a while. I'm not going to, but just like it's so easy to feel rejected or yeah. insulted when in fact that's not the case. Right. Cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. About Thank you, Raha. Space. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. People. A lot. Listeners. Okay. Talk to you oh, soon. oh, hang on. We should say the reason why my picture's big and your picture's small oh, and yeah, my yeah. sound is it's, bad and your sound is good. It's fine. We're recording a Skype call and I'm recording it, so this is how it goes. I know I thought about other that. things cost money and we're like, we're not gonna spend money. It costs money, yeah. It's not gonna happen. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, love you. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>